Well, good morning, and welcome as we gather to worship in the season of Eastertide, worshiping the God who we celebrate is alive and has risen and is with us even this morning. So we welcome you to the service of worship. We also, as a congregation, want to welcome a couple of new members to our church, and so I'm going to invite uh, Travis up to do those wel- words of welcome. Good morning. Uh, we have an opportunity to welcome a few new members. Just a quick uh, announcement before that. Um, if you're a college student uh, worshiping with us here this morning, um, the hospitality committee would like to provide you with a goodie bag as you enter exam season. So that will be this morning uh, after the morning service out in the hallway there in front of the nursery. So we uh, just are thankful that you worshiped with us this year and we pray for you as you enter a busy season here. So um, our first new member is uh, Thea Samporno and um, if she could join me with her fiance, Sean Quinlan, who is uh, also a current member here at Bethel. <clears throat> uh, just a little bit about Thea. Um, she originally grew up in Indonesia and um, after high school uh, made the short journey over to Dort College. So, um, where she got a nursing degree and um, she currently works as an RN at Sanford in Sioux Falls. Um, Sean and Thea are anticipating a wedding here this fall in August, so we're excited for them for that. Um, In her spare time, she enjoys coffee, uh, sleeping, and uh, hanging out with friends. Um, And she also really loves music, and you may have seen her up here before uh, playing guitar or participating in the choir. And so we're thankful for for that, and um, we know you've been working with us for a long time now, and we're just excited to officially welcome you to uh, Bethel today and and, um, come alongside you guys as you begin your lives together. So would you uh, welcome Thea. Our next two members are the Grays, uh, Scott and Ann, if they could just stand wherever they're at, in the back there. Um, Just a little bit about them. Uh, They live west of town here on a farm. Um, Scott is a grain farmer and um, raises hogs and also trucks on the side. Um, Ann runs the family farm finances and also has a tax business on the side. Um, They have two children, um, Alexander. Um, He is a student at Dort and studying ag business. And their daughter, Michaela, is a junior at Unity and um, she's very involved in dance. Um, Just a little bit about their hobbies. Uh, They enjoy camping together. Um, going on bike rides and and playing games. So um, we're just thankful that God has brought you here at this time and place in your life, and we're excited to get to know you and also um, hope that you feel the community um, behind you here at Bethel. Would you join me in welcoming the grace? Greet these uh, families by name and just get to know one another as we grow in Christ as the family of Christ at Bethel. So those things before us today, let's quiet our hearts after a busy week and ask for God's blessing as we worship him. Heavenly Father, we gather before you even as tulips are growing and snow is falling and the crazy mix that is spring, we thank you that you are a God who's in control of this crazy world. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you've shown that control through the story of redemption as you demonstrated your power at your coming, the mystery of your dying, the wonder of your rising, and even now the glory of your presence with us in this time and place. Father, we thank you that whether we are married or single, young or old, whatever burdens or blessings we bring into the doors of this worship service, that you are God who meets with each of us, who knows us by name, who knows our little story and how it fits into your bigger story. And so Holy Spirit, we pray that you would work among us today, that you would open this place up to the fullness of all that you would pour in and that you would then lead us out of this place to pour out those glories and blessings to a world that needs to hear. Father, we offer our lives and our worship to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship. In this first Sunday of Eastertide, the season after Easter, our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, 
that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Friends, that is the gospel we celebrate, that Christ died, that he was buried, and that he was raised. And because of that story, we praise our Savior now and always. Let's sing those words now. Number 400, praise the Savior now and ever. praise the Savior who is with us today brings his word of greeting. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. Would you please on this spring morning give a warm greeting to all around you, especially our guests today.
We celebrated Easter last week and are now in the 50 days of Eastertide, but many of us do not sing his praise for endless days. A mere seven days and we have already moved on, unchanged, unaffected by the real life story of what happened during Holy Week. Let's go before God in a prayer of confession. Our dear God Almighty, we do praise your name for the mighty work which was done for us on the cross of Calvary. Just a week ago in this place, we celebrated again that story of your wondrous grace poured out for us in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if we're honest with you, God, we confess the many times already in the past week when that wonderful story of hope didn't make the difference in our lives that you would have it make. And maybe we even remained silent when opportunities arose to share that story with others. Forgive us, we pray, of these sins and help us today to reflect more deeply on that sacred story. And may our lives abound in grateful obedience and may our service to you be filled with joy. And Lord, most of all, may our testimony be more courageous as we point others to you, Jesus, our only living hope. We pray this in his name. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we sing of that living hope. Mary Ann will sing verse 1. The worship team will sing verse 2 together, and we invite you to join us on verse 3.
my people, prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy, destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken in that day that will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Our response to what God has done should be one of thanksgiving and rejoicing, shining our light and proclaiming to others about the one who is mighty to save. assurance we turn to God's word this morning in the book of Luke the gospel of Luke and we're going to be reading one of the very final stories in that gospel Luke chapter 24 beginning at verse 36 through 49 that's found on page 981 in our pew Bibles and about you if you have a Bible available turn with us please and continue to have it open as we walk through Luke 24 verses 36 through 49 today we finish the series we've been in for most of the spring so far a series walking through this gospel of Luke series called Meals with Jesus, looking at those 10 meals today, the 10th and final meal that Jesus ate. 
is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Next week, Sunday, I'll be leading this service, but we're having a guest pastor, a, a preacher from Zimbabwe named Scott Marks. He has two students at Dort. He's a partner with us in the ministry work that we do in Mozambique, a wonderful, gifted preacher, spirit-led leader in the church in Africa, and we're so thankful to have him fill our pulpit next week, Sunday. And then the week after that, we're going to begin a brand new series in the 400th anniversary year of the Canons of Dort, and we're going to be looking at each of those five doctrines of salvation, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. These doctrines that are confusing, that are contentious, but as we study them, we'll be looking at what do they actually say and what do they say to us in the 21st century. So that'll be what we'll do as we head into the summer month. But today we finish the series in Luke, and as we do, we're, we're asking the same question we've been asking all along. As Jesus invites us to sit down with him for a meal, what are we to learn about Christ, our Savior, and what do we learn about ourselves and our mission in his world? And with that before us this morning, one final time, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, all through this journey through Luke, we have been reminded that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Father, we are also reminded that Christ came not only to multiply the loaves and fish and to break the bread, but also to say that he is the bread of life, and that we who participate in him will never grow hungry. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that once again, by your Holy Spirit, you would open your word to us, or that you would open our hearts and our minds and our very lives to the full working of your power in us today, that you would show us Christ, and that you would show Christ through us in this week. Father, we pray that you would do this to your glory, and in Jesus' name, amen. Luke 24, beginning at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, last weekend, the world celebrated the coming of Easter. This weekend, the world celebrates the coming of Endgame. How many of us have seen that? This is a movie that came out just on Thursday night, and, and, and that first night it shattered any records for ticket sales for opening or pre-opening night. And then on Friday, its first full opening day, it not only shattered the record for the largest opening day, it did it by 30% over the, the most recent film that was the top of the list before them. And already by Saturday morning, Avengers Endgame had set a box office worldwide record in the history of film, and that was before Saturday night or Sunday even happened. It's a film that everyone's going to see. And it's something about it that captures the hunger we have for epic stories. Stories about good versus evil, life and death, heroes and villains. This big story. We also appreciate these stories because of the little things. Through all the buildup of the films that led up to this one, this is the final film in a series, each of them always ends with a, what's called a post-credit scene. That after the plot of whatever the movie is, whatever villain, whatever hero, whatever danger, whatever resolution, after the movie is done and the music has swollen and the credits have rolled, there's always an end scene, a, a little quiet vignette that tells us something about the deeper story. 
And the first of those in the first Avengers in 2012, after this story of this great danger that was approaching Earth, this alien species that was bent to destroy every man and woman and child, and these heroes band together, and they sacrifice themselves, and they save the world from death. At the end of that great story of salvation, there's a post-credit scene, and in that scene, these great heroes are sitting around a table eating shawarma. As a woman is sweeping in the back and there's a man at the grill making more heroes for heroes. Strange scene to end a story of salvation on. Heroes eating a snack. Who would end something like that? Well, not just Marvel. Also Luke. Because that's how he ends this great story of salvation. With a little story of the hero eating a snack. So we pick up where we left off last week. Last week we saw there was a man named Cleopas and his companion, possibly his wife. And they, on that first Easter, were walking away, not from Good Friday, they were walking away from Easter. And as they did that, a stranger joins them, but they were kept from recognizing that it was Jesus. And he hears their story, and then he tells them a different story, that all of the scriptures point to him. And then he sits down with them at a table, and he breaks bread, and in that moment they recognize that it's Jesus, and then he disappears And they run back to Jerusalem, if you remember the end of last week's Sunday. And when they arrive at Jerusalem, they arrive in a room that's filled with excitement because the disciples say, it is true. He's even appeared to Simon. I can imagine the women saying, "Uh, we told you it was true in the morning already. Took you guys the whole day to realize that. Now you're claiming credit? But then Cleopas and his companions say, yeah, it is, and we saw him too. And so this Easter story ends with this great experience of salvation, that Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, Easter is real, the tomb is empty. And in the moment of that excitement, of the sharing of that story of salvation, we pick it up now with our first verse. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. In the moment of talking about Jesus, Jesus appears. Now as we see this, Luke has a dry sense of humor. So you can imagine the scene. They're all there in this room. We're told in the Gospel of John, their doors were locked. And they're like, Jesus is alive. And then, poof, Jesus is there. Hey, everybody. And they're all like, "Ah!" Notice what they respond. They were startled and frightened. Jesus appears in their midst. Peace, everybody. And they're entirely afraid of him. The root shrinks back. They're afraid of what they've just seen. And what they're afraid of, we're told, is not so much that Jesus is there. They're afraid of what they think Jesus is because we're told they were startled and frightened thinking they had seen a ghost. And we have to recognize what's going on here. They're not just afraid that Jesus has come back. Now, you can understand that. There'd be, if you were in your living room with a bunch of friends and you were talking about something and suddenly, poof, there in the middle of you is your friend Bob standing in the middle of the room, you'd probably be startled too. Especially if Bob had died in a bloody car accident three days before, right? But they're not just startled that he's there. They're startled because they think he is a ghost. And Jesus picks up in that language and he says to them, Why are you troubled? Look, I've got flesh and blood. I am not a ghost. And so they're afraid that he is a ghost and he tells them, I am not a ghost. And what's going on here is something that taps into the story of Scripture. Because you see, in the ancient world, there was this belief that you could die, but your spirit could come back as a ghost. That was a widely shared belief. So already in the beginning of Scripture, in Deuteronomy, uh, we have this uh, command that God gives in chapter 18. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there, such as individuals who are mediums or spirits who who can solve the dead. There were people who trafficked in talking to spirits, to ghosts. That was part of the world that Israel was in. A little bit later in redemptive history, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we also see a story of Saul consulting a witch of Endor, and there there is the ghost, the spirit of Samuel, the conjure from the grave to talk to about a battle the next day. This was something that Jews recognized and the world around them recognized. So in the Gospels, in both Matthew and in Mark and in John, there's a story where Jesus is walking one day on the water in the middle of a storm, and the disciples see him, and what do they think? The disciples saw him walking on the water, and they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. 
And this isn't just uneducated, superstitious fishermen. In later in Luke's second book, the Gospel of Acts, there's a story of the Sanhedrin, so the most educated, powerful men of the day, and they're talking about with Peter, and then he says something about the resurrection of the dead, and then the Pharisees, the educated people, say this. They stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? Even the educated knew there were ghosts. And so Jesus comes to them, and he doesn't say, hey, there's no such thing as ghosts. He says, there may be, but I have flesh and blood. And so this is a story where Jesus is approaching them on this first Easter and telling them that he's not what they think he is. And so what we need to see here is that what's going on in this first Easter is they believe that he is not bodily, physically risen from the dead. They believe that he is spiritually and temporarily returned from Hades. You see, what they're experiencing that first Easter is they don't believe that the world is now hollowed by the presence of the bodily victor over death. They believe the world is haunted by the spiritual specter of the victim of a cross. That on that first Easter, they had not recognized what really happened. They thought that this was just a spirit who had returned from the grave to say hello. In other words, what they had done is they had tamed Easter. They had cleaned up the messiness of a resurrected body and made it something that they could understand, a returning spirit. They had spiritualized the resurrection. Now, as we think about what the disciples were doing in that moment of fear when they thought Jesus was just a ghost, spiritualizing the resurrection, taming Easter, they're not the only ones in history who try to do that. Just a couple of days ago in the New York Times, there was an interview between a columnist named Nicholas Kristof and a, a doctor and reverend who's the head of Union Seminary named Dr. Jones. Nicholas Kristof is an agnostic, a very moral man, writes often very positive things about Christians, and occasionally likes to interview Christians just to see what we believe. And so he's interviewing the head of a major seminary. And in the interview, the very first question he asked was this one. Happy Easter, Reverend Jones, to start. Do you think of Easter as a literal flesh and blood resurrection? I have problems with that. And her response, when you look at the Gospels, the story's all over the place. There's no resurrection story in Mark, just an empty tomb. Those who claim to know whether or not it happened are kidding themselves. But that empty tomb symbolizes that the ultimate love in our lives cannot be crucified and killed. In other words, this isn't a real physical, bodily, literal, historical resurrection. It's more like a ghost. Christoph pushes back. Isn't a Christianity without a physical resurrection less powerful and awesome? When the message is about love, that's less religion and more philosophy. But she doubles down. She responded, for me, the message of Easter is that love is stronger than life or death. That's a much more awesome claim than that they put Jesus in a tomb and three days later he wasn't there. For Christians for whom the physical resurrection became a sort of obsession, that seems to be to be a pretty wobbly faith. What if tomorrow someone found the body of Jesus still in the tomb? Would that mean Christianity was a lie? No, she says, faith is stronger than that. Faith is not tied to a physical resurrection. That was just a few days ago in the New York Times. Earlier this year in January, the Anglican Church appointed a, a, a representative to Rome. They have a representative from the Archbishop of Canterbury sends uh, to stay in the Vatican. And the person that was chosen this January is a man named John Shepherd. And this is what he says about the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus ought not to be seen in physical terms, but as a new spiritual reality. It is important for Christians to be set free from the idea that the resurrection was an extraordinary physical event which restored to the life of Jesus' original earthly body. Jesus' early followers felt the presence, his presence after his death, as strongly as if he were a physical presence, and incorporated that sense of a resurrection experience into their gospel accounts. But they're not historical records as we understand them. They are symbolic images of a breaking through of the resurrection spirit into human lives. Jesus lived as a transformed spiritual reality. He's like a ghost. This goes back to a man, John Shelby Spong, who in 1995 wrote a book, and he said this, I don't think the resurrection has anything to do with a physical resuscitation. I think it means the life of Jesus 
was raised back into the life of God, not into the life of this world, and that it was out of this that his presence, not his body, was manifested to certain witnesses. What they're doing is they are taming Easter. They are saying that Jesus did not rise bodily, historically, physically from the dead. He rose spiritually, symbolically from Hades. They are spiritualizing the resurrection. Now, most of us here, liberal scholars like that, of course, we would never do that. We know a little bit better than they do, apparently, that there's something in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith, Union Seminary. For if you are, the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still living in your sins. We need a physical resu resurrection. We believe that. Yes. And yet it's really easy to have our belief and our actual experience of that belief be different. And I want to suggest if we don't have the terror and joy that we read about in Luke 24, maybe we don't believe it quite as much as we think. Because you see, the way that we talk about life and death betrays how we really think about Easter. Now, Christians believe that when you die, there's something called an intermediate state, that there's a space where you're in the presence of God before the resurrection of your body at the end of time. But even with that, when we think about heaven, even the end point of heaven, it betrays something about our understanding of Easter and our lives today. Because most of us, if we're honest, we think about life is bodied, embodied, and death is disembodied. We think about life as physical and resurrection will be spiritual. We think about life as something real and tangible and heaven will be something like floating on the clouds with harps and halos. And because that's how we view life now and life to come, it shapes us. That for many of us, we live with a frantic fear of trying to pack in everything we can into this earthly life. We need to eat all the foods and go on all the trips and do all the things. And if we're single, we have to get married and have sex. We need to do everything we can in the body now because, well, for eternity, we're not going to have one. Only when life will soon be passed, then it's floating on clouds and seas of glass. We spend our lives trying to get all that we can into this physical existence because we think that there's nothing after it but clouds and halos. That's how we live this life. And when something happens which shatters the illusion that we can accomplish that, when maybe you get early onset Alzheimer's, or maybe you get arthritis in your joints, or you have an accident, and your body is crippled, and you realize you're not going to be able to do those things that you hope to do, our response is despair, because this is the only chance we've got. And times of tragedy reveal that bad theology. A week ago today, Easter morning in Sri Lanka, there were those bombs in three hotels and three churches. Almost 300 were killed, many children. This is an image of one of those churches. It's an image of the risen Christ. If you can see the coloring on his robes and on the wall, that is the splattering of blood. That's the image of our world. And let me contrast that with our image of heaven. These perfect white clouds. And what does that image of heaven and resurrection have to do with the life we actually live in this world? I want to suggest it doesn't have anything to do. And our problem with eternity is because we have a problem with Easter. That we have corrupted an image of eternity and that flows from a corrupted image of what actually happened in Easter. And so we go back to the story. The disciples are gathered in the room. The doors are locked. They're excited about this possibility that Jesus is risen from the dead. And poof, he appears and he says, peace be with you. Peace to you who fled from me. Peace to you who denied me. Peace to you, and the reason you have peace is because of what I've done. I have died. And I am not a ghost returning for a visit from the netherworld. I am a physical body. I have flesh and bone. And then he says two remarkable things. First in verse 40, he does two things. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. He's showing them that even in this new glorified body, he carries the wounds of their redemption. He is showing them that heaven is not so separated from the pain of this world that the reality of how we've been saved doesn't carry over, that for eternity those wounds are there. But in showing hands and feet, he shows something else, that in our new glorified body, there's still five fingers. There's still toenails. 
that this is a flesh and blood embodied resurrection. But he doesn't just show that in his hands and his feet. Then he does the second remarkable thing. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Maybe some shawarma? The risen Lord of the universe raiding the fridge. You've heard, I'm so hungry I could die. I've been so dead I'm hungry. <laughs> Remember he was just there at the early meal. He broke the bed, but he disappeared, didn't get supper. Now he's looking for it. And then this very beautiful image that Luke paints. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and the risen Lord ate it in their presence. I want you to see that. The risen Lord with fish grease on his fingers. The king of the universe with breath that smells like halibut. The sovereign Lord with breaded fish crumbs clinging to his beard. That is the image of the resurrection. A God who, the disciples who saw that will one day write in 1 John, a God that we could see and who our hands have touched. That is the resurrection. Later in Acts, when he writes about what God has done, he says that, that he appeared to the people, and we who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, this is the resurrection. We ate and we drank with him. The Son of Man came eating, and the Son of Man rose eating and drinking. That is what God wants us to see about eternity breaking into the present. It is an embodied reality. What does that mean for us? Well, I think two implications. The first of those, and I owe Tim Keller this, this physical, bodily, historical resurrection means that we have been saved from and for the world. We've been saved from and for the world. What do we mean? We've been saved from the world because if you don't believe in a bodily resurrection, again, you are living under the tyranny of packing all you can into this brief physical existence. But when you recognize that we will be embodied creatures in a new creation with a banquet before the king of real food, that means we no longer are living under the tyranny of trying to do it all now. Joni Erickson Tata, young, when she was 18, was paralyzed from the neck down. And she writes in one of her books about a time when she was at a worship service like this, and the worship leader said, okay, everyone, let's, let's bow now before God, and let's come to him in prayer. And she was raised in a tradition where they would do that, and in that moment she recognized that she would never be able to bow the knee again to Christ, and she began to weep and to weep. Until the risen Christ in that moment came to her, and then she writes this. And then I remembered the resurrection. Just before the party gets going, the wedding feast of the Lamb, the first thing I plan to do on my resurrected legs is drop on grateful, glorified knees, kneel quietly before the feet of Jesus, and then I'm going to be on my feet dancing. Can you imagine the hope this gives someone with a spinal cord injury like mine? Can you imagine the hope this gives someone who is a manic depressive? No other religion promises new bodies, a new material universe. Only in the gospel of Christ, the people hurting like me find such enormous hope to live. It frees us from the tyranny of a broken world of broken bodies. Tim Keller writes this, Your feet are going to touch the ground in the kingdom of God. You're not going to float over the pavement. You will march, you will dance, you will eat, you will drink, you will hug, you will love. So you don't have anything to be afraid of. You have no regrets. You can relax because Easter means this world is not all there is. Amen. A new world is coming. That's freeing from the world, but we're also freed for it. That if Christ has come bodily into this world, and the plan of redemption is not clouds in the sky by and by, but a new heaven and a new earth, that Easter changes how we live on the present heaven and earth. Tom Wright writes this. If Easter means Jesus is only raised in a spiritual sense, like the disciples first thought and some modern liberal scholars still do, then Easter is only about me and finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world. One of my seminary professors, Scott Jose, writes, the Christian church has made clear long ago that our faith is not first and finally about ideas and concepts only. No, our faith is gritty and fleshly and tangible and involves nothing short of the renewal of all things. Lakes, mountains, tadpoles, tangerines, and real human bodies. Which means the work that you will all do tomorrow morning is part of a world that God is redeeming. 
that your bodies and the world that you physically work in, those fields that you bury your planters in in the mud, those fields are part of a world that God will renew when heaven comes down to earth. We are saved from this world, but we're also saved by Easter for it. It's the first implication. Second implication is this. We're not just saved from and for the world. Christ's resurrection gives us a mission in the world. When he finishes the fish, what does Jesus do? Well, he takes them back as he did last week in Emmaus to Scripture. And he shows that all of Scripture, the prophets, and also the Psalms and the other writings, the law, they tell us about one story, the story of Jesus. And then he goes on to give that story legs in the present. He says this, This is what was written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day in repentance, and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem, and you are my witnesses. That this Easter story of an embodied Savior who's redeeming in a real world gives us a mission to share that story with others. Again, when Peter writes about this in the book of Acts, notice how he parallels what happened in, in, in this story in Luke. Christ was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. The prophets testify about him. Anyone who believes receives forgiveness through his name. That is the story we are to take. An embodied Savior who now makes us his embodied messengers to tell the story. That's why at Bethel, if you read your bulletin, you'll see that we have an offering tonight for mission and evangelism outreach. And there are 16 of us who are going on that mission to California. And there are four of us who are going out to Haiti. And there are another four of us who are, who are going to Fiji. And there are three of us who are going to Ukraine this summer. And our bulletin cover is from resident global missions who we support with our offerings that go to the denomination that are preaching the gospel around the world. And the bulletin is looking for people to volunteer for VBS. These are the ways this message is going out in our community and to the ends of the earth. Because Christ is risen, he is risen indeed in bodily form. And that means we can bring this message even in places of pain. In closing, I want us to see again the image from Sri Lanka of the risen Christ, his glorified body spattered in blood. A theologian who lives and works who's from Sri Lanka looked at that same image, and this is what he wrote this week. I don't claim to hold the answers for questions about why this would be allowed on Easter. But for me, the key is in that image displayed. The statue stands in katana. The statue is of the resurrected Christ with one hand raised high in triumph, is splattered by the blood of the innocent victims. The statue itself depicts Jesus, even though resurrected and given a body in glory, still bearing the wounds of the crucifixion. That this resurrection in flesh with wounds still present gives us a grammar to live in a broken world of broken bodies. And in fact, that same reality, there was a Sunday school class that met last week Sunday in Zion Church in Sri Lanka. And a seminarian was there who didn't believe in a spiritual ghostly resurrection but a bodied one. And so he asked the Sunday school children, if you, are you willing to die for Christ? Are you clinging to this physical existence, afraid of the skies by and by, or do you believe enough in the resurrection that you'd be willing to die for him? He asked that of a Sunday school class. And every boy and girl raised their hand that they were willing to die. And they all lit a candle, each of them to represent that hope. And they left that room and they went down the stairs to join the family when the bomb went off, and half of them did die. And yet the families of those victims, because Easter is real, know that just as Jesus was raised and ate the fish, so their sons and daughters will be raised and will eat the banquet of the Lamb. That is the glory of Easter. Jesus who eats meals, not just when he was on earth, but for eternity with us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have traced the story of Christ in Luke. The story of a Savior who came eating and drinking, who ate with sinners, with tax collectors and prostitutes, who also ate with Pharisees and the self-righteous, 
who multiplied the loaves and fishes as a foretaste of a heavenly banquet, who on the last night of his life gave us a meal by which to remember him, a broken bread and poured out wine. And even as a resurrected Savior sat down with his disciples again for a meal, and in that meal gave us a mission. Heavenly Father, may we go forth from this place as bearers of this gospel story. Heavenly Father, may a world that is so broken that needs to hear of a world that can be remade in Christ, may they hear it through our words and in our lives. For we pray this in Jesus' name and all of us say, Amen. We respond by singing an old gospel song, a song that speaks of the reality of the story that we have to share. That song is Facing a Task Unfinished. Let's stand to sing.
you may be seated. Let's come to our risen Savior now in prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that in giving that great commission in Luke, it was followed by the command, but stay here until you've been clothed with power from on high. That this kingdom of hope that we bring to the world, we bring not in our own power or by our own goodness, but through the power and the goodness of your presence with us through your Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would even in this place tonight, today, set apart those that you've called as gospel herods in direct ways, whether through missions here at communities as we prepare for the summer and short-term mission trips, whether through service and vacation Bible school, whether it is by the names you've prompted in our hearts to call and to have meals around our tables in our own homes in the coming weeks. Lord, may we, each of us, young and old, married and single, men and women, Bear this message of a resident Christ and a world that's being remade in and through him. Heavenly Father, as we thank you for the Holy Spirit's work among us, we do pray today for your healing work in Sri Lanka. As this has been a week of funerals for the body of Christ in that place and of fear, we thank you for the messages of grace and forgiveness that they've been able to bear to their Buddhist and Muslim neighbors. And how in this moment of grief, they can embody the hope of those who know the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. Father, may you help us as a global church to stand with them in the coming weeks, months, and years. Heavenly Father, as a congregation, we thank you for the missionaries who have gone out from this place, for Kelly and April working in Spain, for Dan and Jan Kuiper working in the border of Mexico and Texas, the partnerships we have with farmers in Mozambique and in Nicaragua, Pastor Vasi Miranda serving in Ukraine. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is at work around this world and that this gospel even this day is going forth, a gospel of a risen Savior. Father, we thank you for the congregations of this community which preach the same gospel. We pray today for Central Reformed and Pastor Van Rathbun and their entire congregation as they bear this name. Heavenly Father, we also thank you as a congregation for the signs that we see of your new life in us. We thank you with Scott and Anne Gray for the journey that they're beginning with us to serve shoulder to shoulder in this kingdom call. We pray that you would help them to be a blessing to us and we to them as we glorify your name together. We pray this also with Thea and with Sean. We pray that you would bless Thea and Sean as they approach marriage later in the summer, but also as they serve, that they also would experience in this place and season in their lives the wonder of a gospel that is true. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the schools of this community, especially those where they're able to name the risen Christ in each part of the curriculum. We pray for our college students as they approach the end of semester and for some even graduation approaching. Lord, we pray that you would shepherd them, give them sharpness of mind, calmness of heart, and in this learning about you and your kingdom, a vision and a mission for how to use that learning to serve you. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray with Jason Meyer as he finishes a round of chemo tomorrow, we pray that you would strengthen him. We continue to pray for so many in our body who are recovering from disease and, and weakness, who are approaching tests in this coming week. Lord, so many of us experience that these physical bodies are breaking and broken by age, by mental illness, by quiet pains. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder that our bodies will be made new that we will have a glorified body even as you gave one to your son Jesus. That death has been swallowed up in victory and so Lord, we long for the day when every tear will be wiped away and this new creation does indeed break forth. As we do that, we do pray that you continue to watch over the work of our lives and our hands. Pray especially for farmers who are seeking to sow the crops in these weeks so that you give drying conditions that you'll enable a window of good opportunity to plant and that you continue to give rain and sun and that you will bring a harvest, that you'll give us patience and trust as we wait. Heavenly Father, may those of us who are working and maybe seeking new callings, Lord, may you give assurance that you will open the right door in your time. And for each of us, Lord, may you help us in this week to recognize the power of the risen Christ walking our hallways and in our businesses and in our schools and in our families and our homes. 
Heavenly Father, we also do pray for those who continue in these days to struggle. Lord, you know the struggles of our hearts with temptations, with addictions, with tensions in relationships, the fears we have of the future, the regrets of the past. But we thank you that because Christ is risen, we stand in his victory. So Lord, do your work among us in this week, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We bring our offerings, the first for the ministries of this congregation and denomination, including a resident global mission, which is, again, you can read about in our bulletin. We, our second is for Christian education, and as we give our offerings today, we're going to be reminded that the Christ who came eating and drinking, who rose eating and drinking, will come again, and we will be invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. That song is, Hallelujah, He is Coming. The worship team will sing stanza one, women stanza two, men stanza three, and all of us will join in four and five. Thank you. 
Friends, the risen and bodied Christ who will come is the one who by his spirit is here and who sends us out in his victory. Our closing song is victory in Jesus. We'll sing stanzas one and two. We'll receive God's blessing. Then we'll sing stanza three. As we leave this place, again, I invite you to congratulate and welcome Scott and Ann and Thea as they join us as new members. So go out in that victory reminder for college students, there are goodie bags as you prepare for exams. Those are in the back, and you're welcome to take those, each of you, as you leave this place. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gives that great commission, and then the passage we didn't read, those last verses, it says, as he is taken up into heaven, he raises his hands and he blessed his disciples, likely with this blessing that he gave to the priest. Receive it now. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.